Good morning. My name is Maddie Bunting and I am the Dean's Chief Student Ambassador for the UC Riverside School of Public Policy. I am delighted to welcome you all to today's webinar with our special guest, Ms. Rose Mays, the Executive Director of the Fair Housing Council of Riverside County. Hello. <laughs> Hello, thank you for joining us, Ms. Mays. Um, before we, we bring up our guest speaker, I would first like to spend a few moments going over the format for today's webinar. For the first part of today's online event, Ms. Mays will give a presentation. Afterwards, I will bring up a panel of student discussants for a student roundtable discussion. Then we will open up some time for questions from the audience at the very end. Audience members, if you have any questions you would like to pose during the Q&A session, please do not send them via chat, but rather via the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Audience members can submit their questions anytime throughout the seminar via the Q&A feature. You do not have to wait till the audience Q&A to do that. I will then pose audience questions to Dr. Brownheim, to Ms. Mays directly once we reach the audience Q&A portion of today's event. Wonderful. And now, as my colleague shares the screen, we would like to play a video of my fellow classmate, Paola Loera, who will be introducing our guest speaker. Thank you, Maddie. As previously mentioned, my name is Paola Loera, and I'm a Dean's Brand Ambassador for the University of California Riverside School of Public Policy, as well as the student intern for the Civil Rights Institute of Inland Southern California. It is with great pleasure that I introduce Ms. Rose Mays, Executive Director of the Fair Housing Council of Riverside County, as well as Vice President of the Civil Rights Institute of Inland Southern California. Ms. Rose has worked in public service for more than 30 years and is known by her colleagues in Riverside and beyond as a woman who is not afraid to fight for what she believes in, committed to justice, equality, and equity. The leadership of Ms. Rose Mays in Riverside County has created a vast type of change for the region. A proud University of Redlands graduate, Ms. Rose has received many awards in her service to the community, including the Spirit of the City Award from the City of Riverside, the Greater Riverside Chamber of Commerce Citizen of the Year, and the Housing Opportunity Collaborative of the Inland Empire Excellence Leadership Award, among many others. I am delighted to introduce Ms. Rose Mays. The floor is now yours. Thank you so very much, Paula. Thank you, thank you. Uh, first, let me thank you for this opportunity uh, to share some of the fair housing undertaking with our community. Uh, and let me tell you just a little bit about myself. I was born and raised in Houston, Texas, Melville, Louisiana, in the South. Both my mother and father, Roosevelt and Lucy Green, there were 14 kids. And out of the 14 kids, I was the 10th child. We were poor and it was a beautiful, beautiful life. Every day, I thank God that I had a beautiful mother, hardworking father, and most importantly, they had high moral standards for her kids. And they demanded that we work hard, we respect one another, we look out for our sisters and brothers and for our neighbors and for our community. And for that, I thank them for that. We, I learned to work at a very early age. At nine years old, I looked at the beautiful fields in Melville, Louisiana, where I picked cotton. Picking cotton was the order of the day during the most important time of the year, September, when we had to go back to school. But that did, but that did not mean for us not to learn how to work hard. That taught us how to work hard. I went to a segregated school and also in going to that school, we learned uh, an important lesson, regardless to whether or not 
you had a page that was torn out of that book that was sent to you from a white school, you still had to make out what it what that page that was torn out said because you were given a test on that. We had to endure also those N words that was written in the books, but that was okay because at least we had books. That's what they thought at that time. So we were very proud as a family to be able to get through elementary. There was no junior high school and there were no, uh, there were no high school. We had to go to another city in order to finish our education. However, before I was able, before I had to go to another school, I went to, we moved to Houston, Texas. And there was a different story altogether. We still were able to finish high school. All of us, when you see my sisters and my brothers, what you're looking at, you're looking at three of them, once that went to the military, three of them that was CEOs, three of them that was in business for themselves, social workers, and you see supervisor. I have had a beautiful life with my family and continue to do that. We're all successful. I attended the Houston Community College. Also, that's my sisters and my brothers. And also I attended Texas Southern University. It was not until I made my transition here to California that I finished my master's and my bachelor's degree at the University of Redlands. It, is, uh, it was a challenge that I was going to make sure because my mother and my father, they demanded that we get as much education as possible. Most of us uh, did not get, have an opportunity to get a college degree, but the majority of us ended up being in supervisory position, being in uh, having three business opportunities that they were very successful with and I was one of the one with also a business that I own three record stores in Houston, Texas. So I'm very proud of those accomplishments. And also I want you just to know a little bit about myself that when my mother say do something good for everybody, for your family, for your neighbors, for your community, I did that. And we were taught to make sure that you looked out for your own sisters and brothers. And we did that as well. We all watched out and looked out for each other. We made sure that everyone got their homework out and made sure that each one of us finished high school and to go on to college, community college, if not a four year university. That was the challenge for all of us to look out for each other. Um, I started volunteering at a very, very early age because I used to have to do things not only just for the neighbors as my mother would tell us to do. When I moved to California, I made that transition in 1979 because the reason why I came to California, it was because my sister Katie Green, she attend, she was in the military and I wanted to do something a lot greater than what I was doing in Houston because that's where I owned three record stores. I wanted to do something more. So that is the reason why I transitioned to California. I started volunteering. I volunteered for the Fair Housing Council of Riverside County as a tester. Well, most of you may not know what a tester is because you don't know what some, most people don't know what fair housing really is all about. It is number one, affirmatively furthering fair housing for everyone, making sure that everyone has an opportunity to live in a community that they can afford and of their choice. And it's not based upon, it's based upon whoever you are whether or not you are white, black, whether or not you have a disability, whether or not 
It's your national origin. Uh, either just sexual orientation. There are so many things, and I don't want to take the time to go through all of these federal and state fair housing laws, because I want to tell you about some of the issues that we deal with here in, in, the, uh, in, in this um, Fair Housing Council. Um, most of us on this panel have been discriminated against. All of you, I have. I know that because sometimes you can't identify some of the coded messages that you have been told when you went to purchase a home or to rent an apartment, or you went to either just be who you are. Well, one of the things that they would tell you, they tell you in a very subtle way. Number one, oh, I'm sorry, but this is a quiet neighborhood, especially if you're young, a very young college student. Oh, you may not like this because of that. There are a lot of children involved and they do have a lot of, a, quite a bit of plan and they're outside all the time and they will disturb you. Oh, if you go to purchase a home and you've called in advance, and you want to see the home. But when you get there, they say, oh, but I have something else to show you in that another area. Because it is an area that they know, they have been told that number one, they don't want certain type of individuals living in that particular neighborhood. Right, if you decide that you want to have, if you do have enough to purchase there, number one, they tell you that, Oh, you may not be able to bring, to build a ramp for your house in this particular neighborhood. There are many, many things that you must take a look at. When things are coded, they're not as overt as we would like to see them or hear them. I need some water. Uh, I've had many challenges, even before as a tester when I got here. One of the things that I've done and wanted to tell you about is the fact that when I left here in 1990, 1985, I went to Seattle, Washington, and I worked for the Wall Street Journal. Excuse me a minute. And in working for the Wall Street Journal, I learned a lot. I worked for them five years. And in working for the Wall Street Journal, and I lived in Seattle, Washington, and I learned a lot of things. And when I came back to Riverside in 1990, I looked around. And when I looked around, I saw that number one, there was nothing there to, nothing in Riverside to remind me of Martin Luther King, John Lewis, Rosa Parks, anybody. So I asked the city manager, I said that there is something that's missing in this community. Have we ever had any type of events here in this city that will represent black people? The only thing I knew of was the Black History Month parade. That was it. So I said, uh, I would like to do something to see if indeed that we can organize something here that will represent African American, in this community, especially Martin Luther King. And it was then that I went to the community. And the community was very much enthusiastic about doing that. What we did, we, we created the 5013C, the Riverside African American Historical Society, and we had some long range goals and some short range goals. But we decided that we would do it slowly because we know that we had to educate the community. 
The community did not want anything of Martin Luther King. So I went to my friend, Dr. Alan Powell. He was on the Riverside Community College District Board. And he said, yes, there is a Martin Luther King library over here. He said that I made sure that we named one after him. He said, what do you wanna do? Can I help you? I said, yes. So we decided that we would ask the city council to name a street after Dr. Martin Luther King. But the group that we had organized with, they decided that they wanted number one, to name a building as opposed to a street. Well, we ran into a problem with number one was the Latina network. They decided that they did not, they wanted to Cesar Chavez. They wanted to build a name after Cesar Chavez. They were pitting groups against one another. I said, no, we're not going to do that. We are not going to fight one another over an old building to be named after Dr. Martin Luther King, nor Cesar Chavez. We let them have the building. Let's continue to fight for the street. It was a, it was a bitter fight. And, but we finally got it to be named after Dr. Martin Luther King, but it was a challenge. We had to go down to each one of the neighbors in the neighborhood to name that street because Pennsylvania Avenue was mostly of orange grove going towards the UCR. It was then that we were able to get that passed. Then we went on to our second challenge, the uh, Arlington High School. They came and they asked, number one, can you help us? Can you help us to, number one, to name the, high, the only high school, a new high school out in Woodcrest, but to be, to be named after Dr. Martin Luther King? It was then I told them, well, I'm not sure because you're going to, if, uh, if you're ready for a fight, I'm ready to do it with you. And that is when we decided that we would get uh, Martin Luther King High School. It was bitter. It was very, very hateful. It was very, um, when it came to the naming, they felt that it was in Woodcrest where most of the whites lived. And they said that I was, our children would not get a great education and they wouldn't be able to get into the Ivy League schools. So therefore we don't want this school named after Martin Luther King. And there were 72 other names that was given to the Riverside Unified School Board to name that school. But we prevailed in that because of national media along with, so, along with local media that it was, they were named, we named that school. In addition to that, I was in the process, we had organized another group that were called the Martin Luther King Visionaries Foundation, because that is when we decided that we would go after the grand prize, which was the monument. It was a fight. We had many obstacles to overcome. They didn't want to give us a location. They wanted to give it to us on the east side, but mainly just where African-Americans lived, uh, Hispanics, and that was, it and I said, well, that's okay. What we can do, we can, we can do is to try to get it in downtown, Riverside on Main Street, and we were one of the first ones to get a monument on Main Street, which opened the doors of opportunity for many other monuments to come afterwards, which has been a great opportunity for the city of Riverside. It was done, and. 1999, a few months before the shooting of Taisha Miller. And that's pretty much what I want to say about myself and to let you guys know that I really do feel that Riverside has been a great opportunity for growth and opportunity for African-Americans. They have, we have been able to open many doors for a lot of young people. We have, been able to make sure that there was there are policies that are being talked about. We have made sure that there are many opportunities for those, the next generation to carry on, to continue to build. 
And we really, really thought that most of the young people will be a part of this when we got started, but there were just not that many people enthusiastic about that. But now I'm very hopeful because I see that we have done quite a few things now for young people to come to the table to participate so that Riverside can be the city that it should and want to be. That's all I would like to say about me. I have done, I have tried to make sure that I uh, do something that would help not only the young people, but also some of the, uh, prepare them for the next uh, opportunity that's available for them to carry on. We're passing the baton to them. Uh, I want to get back to fair housing because I only talked to you as I was a tester. Now, here it is, come some years later, as being a tester, I always remember Mildred Tyler, who was on the um, Fair Housing Council board. I had a print shop in Woodcrest, the same, the same community where I had to fight for the name of the, the Martin Luther King School. That's very interesting. She walked across the parking lot and uh, I was very, very concerned because I said, what is Mildred tired of my, one of the board members coming here from Fair Housing to my business. And I had a print shop there. I said, well, maybe she knows some printing done. But she asked me, number one, she said, I would like for you to come and put in an application to do, to be the executive director of the Fair Housing Council of Riverside County. You have been doing volunteer work. You know a little about it. You have management skills. Therefore, I would love for you to come and be a part of this. Uh, I said, I love my business. I'm doing great here. I just received a contract from the US Postal Service to put mailboxes in here, along with my print shop. But she said, uh, no, I would love for you to just come and work for Fair Housing. You can get somebody to run this for you. And indeed, I said, well, let me try. And when I became the executive director in 1993, I've been here ever since. I noticed very early on, even as a tester, I had not experienced some of the things that I was hearing on the telephone, when people were calling to Fair Housing Council to talk to counselors. There were many issues that we had to address. There were many, many, many low to moderate income people who could not afford rent, to pay their rent, who were being evicted. There were many of them who did not know what a household budget was, or how to navigate, or to get to find out what they needed to do. They were being discriminated against and didn't even know it. So we were able to do outreach and education. And to, to be the one to tell you that we even went after the person who actually would finance us. We had to do it for the, we do, excuse me, just a moment. We have um, the funding sources, the main people that we had to file discrimination cases against. We have three levels where we can file discrimination cases. That's, that is through HUD, Department of Housing and Urban Development, DFEH, Department of Fair Employment and Housing, and we can get a private attorney. There were things that City of Riverside, we have 14 municipalities that fund us annually. They have to fund us. If you're going to take federal funds for your, through the state to take care of some of your roads, some of your other housing elements, consolidated plans, housing issues, you need a Fair Housing Council. 
We were the only game in town. Of course, they didn't have to use us. They could have gone through number one in-house. But how do you police yourself? When you discriminate, are you going to file a discrimination case against yourself? No. They tried it, so they ended up coming back to us, Fair Housing Council. We had to file a housing discrimination against one of our funding source, which was the city of Riverside. It was from UCR. They called us and they said that we are being discriminated against because of the fact that the owner of these houses that we want to live in here in Canyon Crest, number one, they want us each to have a lease. They are limiting us to four. Not only that, the owner need a permit. I said, that is not correct. So we had, they asked us, so would you join us here in city council chambers so that we can discuss this with city council members? And indeed we did. There were over 300 students from UCR that came and they spoke, 46 of them. And I had to go up to the mic, the last one. And I told the city of Riverside then, bold as I possibly could, you pay us for doing your fair housing services, but when you break the law, we have to make sure that number one, that we, file charges against you again to make sure that you treat everybody equally. You are wrong and I'm ready to go wherever you need to go with this. So I beg of you, please do not vote on this today. Let us have some mediation done on that. Of course they didn't do it. And therefore we put it in the hands of a private attorney. And as you can see, these students came out on top. These, this is the type of work that we do. We don't mind going to the extent of what we have to do to make sure that everyone is treated equally, regardless. It was not a how it was not a housing problem issue. What it was, it was that they did not want the students at those homes, mainly because it's like any other young person, they will have parties on the weekends, therefore, they did not want them at the uh, they did not want them living in that part of the community they want to restrict them to certain areas and therefore we made we corrected a wrong to make sure that those students did not have to go as individuals but as a group and to live in housing so i want to commend them they were bold they were bodacious but most importantly that they fought for their rights and they came out on top. The other thing that I would like for you to do, if you have any questions for me, because I don't wanna just talk about me, there are other issues that we would like to talk about, I know. So I will give you an opportunity to ask me some specific questions because I can go on and on telling you one incident after another, but I thought this one will be more applicable so that you can know that the students at UCR, Cal Baptist, uh, Los Angeles University, River, Riverside Community College, we deal with you every day in terms of what some of your issues are. And there are many. So I would like for you to ask me some uh, of those uh, concerns. Yes, um, as our audience, please utilize the Q&A feature down below. Um, but Ms. Mays, I would love to just read a note from one of our audience members, Maribel Nunez, uh, from the Inland Equity Partnership, Inland Equity Community Land Trust. And she says, yes, Ms. Rose Mays, fair housing needs to be part of the housing element conversation and planning. We are organizing a housing element coalition for diverse voices to do public participation. Well, let me, I, I had a person who is who specialized in there. I'm not sure if he's on there or not, but he said, just in case you couldn't, I would love to be a part of it.
but I don't specialize. I'm not an expert in some of these things. So therefore, what I try to do, I try to stay in my lane. What I would like to do is to read what he wrote. Is that Tony Miles' statement? The, uh, the land equity for the housing element. Well, let me tell you what we do for each one of these municipalities. And it's number one, what we deal with, number one, is that if indeed that these municipalities that they receive federal funds, they have a housing element, they have a consolidated plan, and therefore what we try to do is that we do the service and give them the feedback. We do surveys for them, we do testing to find out what the number one discrimination in their communities are. And also what we try to do is to make sure that they are making sure that they um, doing inclusionary housing for everyone. And that comes through that housing element. And if they are not, because they cannot just build housing just for those individuals who can afford to pay anywhere 400 to $500,000 for home ownership. So if the, we are just finished a housing task force with Mayor, Mayor Bailey, and what they are doing right now, and in, in that they found that they were about 18,000 houses short of low income housing, affordable housing. And that is one of the number one impediment to equal housing opportunity. So therefore that has been given to them annually. It was not until the federal government came in and said, unless you decide that when you have developers coming into your community wanting to build housing, it has to be equitable. It has to be for low income as, so, as well so as is for others. Housing contractors, they do not like to build affordable housing. There isn't any money there for them because if they're going to build multi-housing, low rent, they, want, they don't want section eight people which is an area income, they have to pay low rent. They want to be able to make as much money as they possibly can. So therefore, what I am looking at is those individuals, contractors who want to come into our community to build housing, that they make sure that they build it where everyone can participate unless the city wants to pay a price for not having them to do that. They can correct that from a policy standpoint. They can make sure that if you want to build housing in our community, you're going to have to build a 20-80, 20% for low income and 80% for fair market value. That can be done very easily. But as I'm not sure if I answered the question for you, but I wanted to make sure that I got that part in. Thank you so much, Ms. Mays. As we um, wait for more audience member questions, um, at this point, I'm, I would like to bring in my fellow classmates for a round table discussion. I'd like to introduce them now. So student discussants, please raise your hand and say hello so we know who you are. Uh, joining me are Utman Eloi. Hello, everyone. Nice to see everyone attending today. Deidre Reyes. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. And Emily Thomas. Hey, everyone. It's so nice to see you all. Um, our first question comes from Emily. Um, hello, Ms. Um, Mays again. I just wanted to say thank you for all that you've done for the community. Um, and as you mentioned, you serve as vice president um, of the Civil Rights Institute of the Inland Southern California. And you mentioned Tisha Miller earlier. And so I wanna ask, what do you think of the Black Lives Matter protests and movement this year and what it means for the history of civil rights in our country and in our Riverside community? Um, I embrace it. Short answer, I embrace it. What I see that it reminds me, as you can see that we go back, I go way back with the civil rights movement back in the sixties. And uh, the only way we were able to make some changes is that we, I was too young, around, I was around uh, in, in my teenage years, but I used to 
be the ones to help to serve the civil rights workers and walkers and protesters. And uh, I think it is um, the only way that you're gonna affect the change in our community. I think the protesters today are the same as they were back in the 60s. They're nonviolent, they are peaceful, they're respectful, they have a message, but most importantly, they have, they are addressing concerns by not only law enforcement, that was the Taisha Miller back in 1999, housing, education, healthcare, and all of those, and employment. They are in those marches, that's what you see. But most importantly, what I love seeing more than anything else that I didn't see earlier on in the 60s, young people, the diversity, and you see people who are concerned and they don't mind stepping up, making that commitment. They are there day and night. And uh, one of the things that they have the social media on their side, that's what I love about it. And they don't mind utilizing that so that they can get their point across and also address the injustices and the impediments and disparities in our communities. So technology is gonna play a great part and they are making it better for the next generation. 50 years later, we're still fighting the same fight. We ask, where did we go wrong? What did we do? Uh, systemic racism is here. Regardless of whether or not people want to admit it or not, it, it is hidden beneath many things of those four or five categories that I mentioned. If you look at what we have, we have number one, individuals. In Riverside, we're only 6% African-American, 52% uh, Hispanic. We are the rest Asian and whites. But when uh, there is a problem in housing, who suffered the most? African-Americans, people of color. When there is this uh, with COVID-19, who is suffering the most? We, even though we're in the minorities, but we're hit the hardest when they are negative. That's systemic racism in education, health, employment, housing. So we cannot deny that any longer. It plays a very big part in what we need to start talking about and the students need to continue to take a look at, continue doing what you're doing. And I know that eventually, may not be in my lifetime, but in a lifetime we will, we will address, we will overcome some of these issues, but they will just be at another level. Thank you. I hope <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for covering that topic. It's so important. And yes, I, I'm also very happy to see the diversity and um, and the youth participating in this movement. So it's um, hopefully change will come soon. Uh, before moving on to another student question, we have um, an audience question from Aaron Dill. Um, he asks, what are some ways that the youth can continue to fight against discrimination? Kind of moving, you know, adding on to what we're talking about, the Black Lives Matter movement. Well, what, what I look at is just that, uh, and I always go back to my, the way the, my value system is, and it coming from the deep south and coming to California, which is, you know, it's one of those types of things where you, actually um, we're supposed to be progressive and all of that. But it's, 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 you, you deal with some of the same issues. And uh, what are some of the ways that young people can deal with it? They have to learn how to understand that a lot of things are coded now. Things, you're, being, you're being discriminated against. When, and I'll, I'll go back to housing. What are the first thing they look at when young people come to to rent a unit, an apartment. Number one, they look at what, what type of clothing they're wearing. 
what kind of tattoos that they have on their arms. They look at what kind of work they are doing. Maybe sometimes that they look at their ass, well, you know that this particular complex, what you're trying to rent from, it's very quiet over here because they are assuming that that young person is not going to want to live in an apartment complex where there is too quiet because he won't be able to bring his or her number one friends over. They are saying that maybe this person cannot even pay the rent or either we don't want any young person over here. Those are the things that young people must look at more than anything else because I know a lot of them have a hard time because they call into our office. And I can give you an example. We had a tenant to come in to call into our office. He went to downtown Riverside, tried to get into one of these expensive apartments in downtown Riverside. He didn't want the apartment. It was for his father, 60 some years old. But before he could really get in the door, they told him, these are for professionals who are working in downtown Riverside. Number one, he was, he didn't look like a professional, he said, because I had on my hoodie. My father looked too old. So that was arbitrary. That was based upon age, and that was based upon. We don't want your kind around. And they were African-American, by the way. And it could have been about race as well. Those are the type of things that young people must take a look at. They're being denied and they don't even know why. Thank you so much. Um, I would now like uh, to have Deidre pose a question. Good morning, Ms. May. Thank you so much for joining us today. You have been incredibly insightful and you have shared so much with us. So my question for you today is you mentioned the John Lewis mural. Um, and many knew him as a civil rights leader uh, since the 1960s and as a chairman of the Student Nonviolence um, Coordinating Committee. Can you give us an example of a time when you got into trouble, but not just any trouble? Good trouble. Well, to be honest with you, um, I, absolutely. Um, thank you for mentioning the John Lewis mural. As you know, we are getting ready uh, to go into the uh, Civil Rights Institute. And in doing so, um, I wanted to student intern Paula, who's working with me, to be able to um, Start looking at and using young folks' talents and their skills. To start our programming, and that's how the John Lewis mural got started. Start asking young people, what would you like to see? And at that time, John Lewis was on his deathbed, and he went out to the Black Lives Movement um, uh, protests and things like that, and he wrote a letter. And I felt that this is a good time to record this particular history, but at the same time, take care of two things at one time, the programming for the Civil Rights Institute and have a, so we can get a broader perspective and a viewpoint of understanding of race, gender, religion, and all of these types of things. So that in this pandemic times that students will have something in, and I wanted we wanted it educational. And so that is the reason why John Lewis mural. And of course, we didn't expect it to be just about a, a full block of it, but we got it and we used it. We took advantage of it. And it was one of those things that, um, it was a driving force behind artists volunteering their time. And we wanted to make sure that the young people had an opportunity to go by to read and to understand what John Lewis was all about getting into good trouble. Good trouble is something that you do that will benefit not only you, but the community, your family, society, so that the next generation 
will not have such a hard time in trying to pass the baton or pass it on. You can take it from there to another level. They can take it to another level. So that's what we were aiming for. And I think that we achieved that. However, again, because of the ugliness of hate will raise, will surface that it was, you know, it was vandalized. And we were very, very disappointed with that. I'm so sorry it was vandalized. That is just not the message, <laughs> not what should happen. Um, we do have another audience question from Rob Collins. Um, and he asks, what link are you seeing between zip code and opportunities? Are you seeing any progress? Between, I'm sorry, repeat that. Yes, I'm sorry, between zip code and opportunities. And if you're seeing any progress. Um, well, I would say, yes, we are. Because anytime that you, uh, 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 anytime when it comes to education, anytime it comes to housing, anytime it comes to healthcare, we see that progress has been made because this person like UCR students it's individuals like people from Cal Baptist, or students from La Sierra University, RCC. These students are making a difference. I can see that because whenever that there is an issue, we are able, they're able to call into not only just our agency, but to call into Inland County Legal Services. We put them sometime in touch with private attorneys when there are issues like that, that progress that's being made between zip codes, that we are able to tell our elected officials that we must do the same thing in zip codes 92502 as 92501, because I give you a typical example, what they did not want in 92501 zip code. Number one, when I went to the city council to tell them about the mixed use project, the Mission Heritage Plaza, that Fair Housing Council had gathered up lots and had purchased property in downtown Riverside. And what we wanted to do was a mixed use project on it. And part of that was gonna be 72 housing units. And those 72 housing unit, units, units were going to consist of number one, low income housing that individuals could afford. We would be using some of section eight. And I tell you, I walked into one of the city council, uh, city council office and I told him about that. And first of all, he said, well, I be doggone if you, we're going to put any children running across Mission Inn Boulevard, a block and a half from the Mission Inn Hotel to live in downtown Riverside. No, we can't have that. Well, of course, me being as um, sometime as Southern as I am, I said, well, you know one thing, let me do this. Let me walk out this door and let me come re-enter re and, uh, so we can start this conversation all over again, because what you just did, it was, what you just said was very dis discriminatory. So let's start all over again. We at Fair Housing are getting ready to engage in a mixed use project. And we are going to have 72 affordable housing for Section 8 people, for veterans, for senior, and for college students. Oh, he said, then we allow, let's talk. Because you give a person an opportunity to think about what they have said, because that was unprofessional. And the second place was, you are representing Ward One. Why would you not want affordable housing? You have the high end for professionals, why not get something for individuals of area income, low to moderate income individuals? It's social justice. It's equity. 
Thank you so much for sharing that story and for, for fighting for, for those living in Riverside. That is amazing. And you were able uh, to get it passed, you know, pushed through. So, well, it's, it will be up. It, the building will be ready in 2022. And we have people asking right now, how can they make sure that they are part of that can rent, can rent an apartment? Uh, so we do have all of that. Uh, it took a long time for us to get there, but we did get there. And I am very, very pleased that we were able. Uh, and all of the other, after that, I didn't have any problems with that, uh, getting uh, the other council members, the other mayor, to buy into that particular project. It's a mixed use project. And I think it's be beneficial to all concerned. Yes, uh, just congratulations on that. And I look forward to, to seeing it um, and that so many will benefit from that. Um, I do have the next question. And, and I asked you this a little bit earlier before the, the webinar began, but I, I think um, our audience members would be interested as well. Uh, moving forward, what should the Biden-Harris administration focus on in order to help families struggling to pay their mortgage or their rent? Well, um, I, I thank you so very much because for that particular question, because I think that is very, very important that number one, let me get me a drink of water on this one. <laughs> We are at a critical place right now. I'm very concerned. When you have boots on the ground and when you see people who are actually hungry, when you see people who are needing food, when you see people who can't pay their rent, when you see people who are living in the parks, when you see people who are standing at McDonald's, Jack in the Box. I mean, these are men, women, and children. It says a lot. Somebody, Nancy Pelosi, along with some of the other, they need to start acting and acting now. We need the stimulus money and we need it like yesterday. And as far as I am concerned, they need to start moving right now. However, there is something that is at our doorstep and we need to take care of that. They need to get that vaccine. They need to make sure that people are aware of what they need to do in order to stay healthy. They need to make sure that these, that, that these individuals are taken care of I think it's too much politics into the health and welfare of these individuals. The crisis is at the door. Given December the 31st, come January, we're going to have another housing crisis, food crisis on our hands. And this one is going to be different from the one in 2007. We are in a dilemma. We're in a fight of a lifetime. We can see it. The only reason we're here now to take the sheer number of calls that we get is because of the fact that each one of these municipalities, 14 municipalities that we actually have to do service for, they gave us extra money to make sure they did not want the phone calls coming into their office because not only are they talking about food, they're talking about shelter. Not only they're talking about shelter, they're talking about how their kids are gonna get back into school. They don't have the necessary tools to work from home. There are so many issues out here, unbelievable. That is the reason why we make the sacrifice to do what we have to do in order to make sure that our community is serviced. And we don't mind because we have been uh, uh, doing this for, 30, I've been doing this for 30 some years and some of the uh, staff in here volunteer some of their time, even coming in on the weekend sometimes making sure that we can help pay some of the rents for those individuals who need their rent paid. 
The politicians need to get the act together. That's the only thing I could say. They need to have, and not only just this one or twice the stimulus, it should go on until these people are back on their feet again. Not only are they going to be dealing with how to keep and to pay their rent, they're going to be dealing with hostile managers, hostile owners of these apartments, hostile landlords, because what they're going to do is they're going to want to increase in their rental rates. If they couldn't pay the old rental rates, they certainly would not be able to pay those. They have got to catch up with their utilities. They have to put food on the tables again. They have to try to find someone to help to, to uh, take their kids to school if they're trying to get back to work. There are many issues here. And I, it's going to take time, the same way it took time for those individuals who went through the last housing crisis to get back on their feet. So the only thing that I see that we have a problem, USA, and we must do something about it. Yes, and, and as quickly as possible. Yes. Um, yes. Um, thank you uh, for your words, Ms. Mays. I, um, I see that we are getting more audience questions, which is very exciting, but I would just like to take this moment to remind the audience, um, if you do have a question, please go ahead and type it in, in the Q&A feature below, and I will go ahead and pose your question uh, to Ms. Mays once we uh, get there. I would like to ask Desiree Sanchez's question. Um, she said the LA Times recently highlighted the horrific crime-free housing policies in Riverside. What is the Fair Housing Council doing to protect our, uh, our people of color, uh, domestic violence survivors, and formerly incarcerated renters' rights against these crime-free housing policies? Well, uh, uh, that's a good question because one, we hope to be a part of that. I hope they will get in touch with fair housing because we have had crime-free policy in the fair housing uh, in Riverside, uh, along with one of our current board members, John Stard. I'm quite sure that is the same one. And usually what we try to do is to monitor those types of things. Uh, we uh, have a part on the agenda so we can tell the tenants as well so as managers and owners their rights and, and responsibility under California Civil Code. We tell them what the federal and state fair housing laws are all about. And not only that, we make sure that whenever there are the crime free that are at an apartment complex, we do not allow them to use that against those individuals who are going through like domestic violence, uh, any type of a misunderstanding between the landlord and the tenant, we serve as mediators with that. So we make sure, number one, that the apartment complex, they are in compliance with each one of those establishment, fair housing laws, and also the California Civil Code, and also the things that we deem when we start with our mediation with them. Because what we are finding out when they impose these types of things, this is just another way of manage of owners, especially. They are getting around not wanting certain type of people in their units. And there is some what we call discrimination. And we want to make sure we monitor that. We will love and we want to be a part of that, to continue to be a part of that. We have not been engaged lately because of the fact that of this coronavirus that we're going through. But at the same time, we will continue to monitor that with the crime-free project that will be going into these units because we know what it's all about. We have had to call them out many times. So uh, just remember, if they want fair housing to be a part of it, that's part of our duties and responsibility to do these municipality in which that we work with. Thank you so much. Uh, next, we have a question from Utuan. 
Hello, Ms. Mays. Uh, I just want to thank you for so much for doing this presentation. Uh, as someone who doesn't live in Riverside, it's been really interesting to learn so much about the city and then all the contributions that you've made toward it. So I'm really appreciative to that. Uh, my question was when you discussed about the Ford renter limit in Riverside and how it's discriminatory and some of the practices that involve it. Uh, from that, I was wondering if you could provide any other examples that are similar to the four renter limit. Uh, I feel like it'd be a good way to raise awareness to maybe see if some of our audience members are uh, victims of similar practices of discrimination, but uh, don't know about it. Okay. Um, what uh, what uh, what we've seen thus far was that whenever that city, we watch their agenda very, very closely, especially we have three universities here. And when we have a college, we have a lot of colleges here as well. What we have learned through that, that there are some homeowners that they rent their, they rent their homes out. And they also, what they do is just they, they cut up their homes so that they can make bedrooms and they can put anywhere from uh, 10, 12 students in one house. Uh, and what the city tried to make was the fact that they could no longer do that. Well, what I want to do with their home is their home. Uh, and as far as we were concerned, we, want, we wanted to keep an eye on that. And whenever we get a call, we would ask number one, the student to make sure that they come in as a family because what would happen if they would do that to the students coming in, if they had to get an individual lease, then you would discriminate against families who would want to rent some of those homes in that same area, like a family with four or five kids and they would limit the number of people who can live in those homes, that will be discriminatory. And as far as I'm concerned, if indeed that they came in as a family-like and they were not limited to, limited to a, a number of person per bedroom or something to that effect, and if they broke their living room or dining room up into a place that they want to live, they would not have an overlay saying that, number one, you can't do that in this part of Canyon Crest. You can do it in any other part of the city. That's discriminatory. And so those are the types of policy uh, re, re uh, uh, districting that we were looking at what they had on their agenda. And that's when we would step up and say, no, this is incorrect. Why can it be done in other parts of the city, but you don't want it to be done in Canyon Crest, which is a high end part of the city. And so those are the things that we try to make sure that the city stay true to when they start redistricting some of these types of policies. Did that answer your question? Um, yeah, that was more than enough. Thank you so much. Uh, the other thing I want uh, uh, students to remember as well, to make sure when, when, when you run into a home that is being split up like that, to make sure that they know they have to go under one lease agreement as opposed to having the owner, because when one person gets from under that, if they have five, the other four are gonna to have to carry that lease. Tell them to watch out for that. Ask them to come to us because sometimes what we are finding that sometimes those lease agreements are not beneficial to them, but we will help them to take a look at it. Either we have our Inland County Legal Services to tell them, ask the owner or ask the manager to take that out because sometimes they are stuck with the lease. And if something should happen like this pan pandemic that we have right now, some of them can't get out of these lease. 
And if some of them knew before time that this would impact them later on, they would not have signed those leases. So there is a service here at Fair Housing that they can utilize as opposed to signing those leases before uh, getting some legal counsel on it. Thank you for telling us about those services. I know I've spoken to many friends and we often don't read uh, the contract, the fine line, you know, it's it's legal jargon and you, just, um, you don't necessarily understand what you are signing up for. And um, unfortunately, I, I know a lot of students are struggling with that now with, with the pandemic. Um, I would love to share a message from one of our audience members. Uh, Gregory Anderson said, Thanks to our tireless, courageous, and inspiring leader, Ms. Rose Mace. Oh, um, thank you. <laughs> I just thought that was sweet, and I, I agree. Um, but from Joe Long, another audience member, um, he has, which Riverside zip codes offer better education opportunities for minorities, better job opportunities? Which area in Riverside? Well, I, 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 I would hope that I could say all of it, but let's face it, we got to be real with, uh, with these types of things that so we have had to uh, uh, be a part of the uh, Riverside Unified School District uh, Roundtable. And this is where sometimes we would go and meet with the, um, the superintendents of schools in the Riverside Unified School District there were issues that was on the east side of Riverside, which were low to moderate income and where Latinos and African-Americans, uh, they lived. And there was, they had issues. Some of them had, uh, and one of the, one of the reason is, is that they were, um, felt that they were not been given some of the same opportunities as some of the other schools. I like the one I talked about in Woodcrest, the area, some of the uh, ones that I talked about uh, in the, um, um, maybe the Arlington area. That's the reason why some of these people, uh, some of these parents would come to us. And even some of those, because one of the things that they're looking at is the, uh, the educational, uh, the, they are, and especially during this pandemic time, pandemic times, they do not have the equipment. Most of these schools, or most of these uh, young people on the east side, they do not have the connection, the internet connection. Some of them don't have the laptops. Some of them don't have the things that's needed in order to. And and you you got the stats on that. I, I I don't have that, and and I and I won't I won't try to speak from the educational standpoint. But we have heard it all. We get calls in here about whether or not we have laptops for giveaway or something like that. They don't have the tools necessary to take to stay at home to to be learning from home. And even when it was not during this time they were complaining about various things. They felt that number one, some of the schools were not kept up on the east side as it was in some of the other areas of uh, the city of Riverside. There were some things that they wanted on the east side that they were not getting. But I have to give, give a shout out to Andy Melendrez because of the fact that he got involved and now we're beginning to see things getting better on that side. The round table where we used to come to, they cut that out because we were giving them too much feedback that they could not handle. And when they are trying, they said that we have our own, but what it is that, that now that they are doing other work with RCCD along with the university, things are getting better, but I, I'm not an expert in that area. But I do know that part in dealing with the round table that I used to go to for the Riverside Unified School District. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, next, we have another question from Deidre. Thank you so much. I just wanna start with a compliment, Ms. Mays. I am in awe <laughs> of your spunk, your tenacity, your strength and your passion. Like you have 
blaze the trail. You, you, you're just doing so much dynamic work. And I wanted to thank you so much for that. Um, you're amazing. You're amazing. If you've not heard it today, you're amazing. <laughs> and we are so grateful and so appreciative for you, your time, and just for everything that you represent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of uh, UCR and, and scholars and just everyone in Riverside, they're very blessed to have you. Very Thank blessed you. to have you. In terms of uh, systemic racism and social justice, Proposition 21 was an initiative, which was on the ballot this year. It didn't pass. And so I wanted to know, in terms of like the proposition, um, can you speak to what that proposition um, now means without you know having passed and what rent control is and the connection to affordable housing? If you can speak to that connection, that would be fantastic. Good question. Uh, I did a little research on that. Um, because I, whenever you say rent control, uh, housing, fair housing, <laughs> we go crazy. <laughs> but one of the things, rent controls is intended to protect the tenants uh, from being priced out of cities and neighborhoods due to the housing crisis and the lack of affordable units. You know, it's all about greed. You can get, you want as much for your unit, your housing as possible. But the increase in demand for housing and a limit vacancy rate in California have, a, have an increase anytime something is in demand. You know that yourself. That's what we see that's going on right now. The wages, with wages being stagnated and it's difficult very, very difficult for with the wages going up and and everybody's feeling it. And when something in demand and you try to get the owners, managers, landlord want to get as much as they can for their unit or for their housing or for their complex. They try to get that. But who suffers as a result of that? It has always been a fight. Anytime they put that on the ballot, there is no one single solution. It has gone down in flames. You can never, never get that to pass. It's too much money that, and, and one of the things they're not going to the voters, and most time we are learning that people do not read those propositions. Most times they say most of them don't even pay attention to them. I, as a matter of fact, uh, I had somebody, several people to call me said with this last time, would you please give me, oh, how did you vote on all these propositions? I said, I think in order for you to be well informed, why don't you read them and let's discuss them so that you will know why you're voting a certain way, why you need to vote yes or no, because you need to know how it will benefit you or not benefit you. So you, you've got to try to educate the public, but it is really uh, the affordable housing. We need affordable housing in all units. And we know that some of these people are already priced out. The average person, and, and, and I know I'm only talking about 10 years ago. You could, you could live in a one bedroom apartment for $695, $595. Now it's up to $1,500. Yeah, I don't see how people who are working with one income, they used to pay 30% of their income for housing. Now it is up to 50% some of them are paying. There's not enough affordable housing. Uh, the Housing Authority, Section 8, has a 25-year waiting list 
people are trying to get in on section eight. Some of them, it will be a lifetime. Some of them will not be able to get on section eight. What are you seeing families living with families? Have you ever noticed going down a residential area, the number of cars that's parked on the street now? What do you think that is all about? You send three, four, five families living together. They cannot afford to live in a one bedroom unit hardly now. And what you find in what we're finding now, and I know that I'm giving, but these are all some of the inequities that we see and the, and the discrimination that we see that once a landlord, a manager or owner find out that you have moved somebody else in with you, they come back to you and wanna charge you more money because you have an extra person and they will write you out a new lease because of the fact they wanna make more money. And the other thing, that we find out that when owners, managers, landlords, they see that tenants are trying to get ahead of the game. They will not give them a year's lease anymore. They wanna give them quarterly lease. And what is that all about? It's, it's all about getting more money from people who are struggling already. So I say to people, if you go, if you're going to sign a lease, ask for a year's lease. Come to fair housing, go to Inland, Inland uh, County Legal Services, have them to negotiate for you. It is tough for low income people to make it because everything is working against them. I'm concerned we have a problem in the affordable housing area. We have a problem with families who are going to be able to stay together. And so we must start addressing these concerns. Well, and that um, another audience member has a follow-up uh, to what you just discussed. Catherine Rodriguez is wondering, is there a way to report landlords doing that type of practice or is it not regulated? And she says she's referring to landlords increasing the prices. Well, you know, that's the problem. It's not, a, there isn't a law that can protect it from increasing the rent. That's why we try to encourage. What we try to do is have workshops. We try to inform the tenants what their rights and responsibility on the California Civil Code. The more we educate, the more we try to let them know if indeed that if you are going to move somebody in to the unit, make sure you go and you ask the landlord, what, what's the criteria? Do I, have to re, do I have to put them on the lease? Can I let them just come to live with me without having the rent to be increased. They are sometime, the landlord might say yes, but when it goes to that owner who wants to make more money, he may come back and say, no, there's no law against that. It's nothing to protect them. That's why we encourage home ownership. Uh, but we encourage home ownership from our first time home values workshop, where we teach you from A to Z how to purchase a home, because now there are opportunities for low to moderate income people to purchase homes. What they can do, number one, because all these 14 municipalities, they're getting money for first time home buyers to get down payment up to 40 to $50,000 down payment assistance. That's great. 
I wish that was coming. I wish that was uh, coming along when I was purchasing a home. You can do that, but there are some strings attached to that. You have to take a first time home by your workshop. You have to know household budgeting. We teach you that free. You can come to us. You can come to Inland County Legal Services for one on one. We find there's a financial educational workshop that we give. They need to start this in elementary school, how to do a budget, financial planning, how if I make X number of dollars, how can I spend that without going over my budget amount that I have for the month, for the week? That need to be taught. That's what the biggest failure is. And we are more than happy. We, we have them twice a month. We have anywhere from 20 to 45 people in a class. Some people have benefited very well from that. Because right now, what we are trying to do is just to make sure that they are aware of the fact that there are, there are, uh, there are different types of uh, benefits out here for them if indeed that they want to make sure that they become financially stable because dealing in these types of apartment complex and trying to uh, stabilize that is up it's like a yo-yo up and down i agree i, I do wish in in school they would teach us more about this um <laughs> it has to start early on yes yes um, our next question comes from Emily. Um, Ms. May, I know we're getting to the end of the program, so I just want to say uh, thank you so much for your work on just the murals of, of um, John Lewis, MLK, um, that you see our students literally drive by past every day, and I do, and every time I see that street and I see his name, I am very happy and very grateful that, that we, we have that representation. So thank you so much for all the work that you have done in our community. Um, this question is, the CARES Rent Relief Program provides monthly rental assistance up to $7,500 per lease to cut leases to cover rent between March 1st, 2020 and December 30th, 2020 for up to six months. Do you believe this is enough? If Congress does pass another relief package, do you believe they should provide more funding um, for housing costs? Okay. I'm going to give you the expert on that, who knows who's dealing with that. She's a program manager, her name is Liz. And um, she would tell you how we told them that was not enough money. So we would tell you how, she would tell you how we went about making that change here at Fair Housing, because we know that, we know that there will have to be more money because there's no way that they're going to be able to get out of this. So Liz, take it over. Thank you, Ms. Mays, and thank you all for the question. It's really important right now. Um, I wanna talk to you about this a little bit from a policy perspective um, so that you can see how some decisions have made things difficult and had an impact on individual families. So as you know, um, the, the CARES Act is federal money, and then that's generally passed down to the state who then trickles it down to the municipalities. Um, once it gets trickled down to that level, it's actually the municipalities that are making the decisions on who has access to those funds, where those funds will be spent. So not every city in Riverside County even has a rental assistance program. Um, there are cities that have chosen to set money aside and Riverside is one of those cities. So the city of Riverside, when everything started with CARES Act funding, I think everybody was operating under the assumption that another stimulus package was going to get passed and there was going to be more money coming pretty quickly. Um, as you know, there's that December 30th deadline on spending CARES Act funding. So when the city started, they gave us some pretty strict um, requirements for people to apply and be able to qualify for rental assistance. They wanted to make sure that it was people that were in very low or low income categories. 
Um, they were requiring copies of birth certificates, social security cards. Um, they were requiring a three day pay or quit notice in the midst of them also passing a law that people could not be evicted. There was an eviction moratorium. So we had landlords that didn't want to give us the documents that we needed to qualify because there was an eviction moratorium and they were afraid they were gonna get each other themselves in trouble, right? So you have all of these kind of conflicting policies coming together. And what happened is that we weren't able to distribute money very quickly in the very beginning. On top of that, all of these barriers make it take longer in our process to get money into people's hands because we have to collect so much data. So when making policy decisions, it's really important that you look and you see what, what this is going to do short term, short term and long term, especially for organizations that are trying to get this money out there. Um, we are grateful that they've worked with us fairly recently to change those requirements and it's really streamlined now. We can provide actually up to six months with no cap of rental assistance for anybody who is behind on rent. And the documentation is very simple. Um, so if anybody has an issue with back rent, December 4th, tomorrow is our last day to accept applications. If you've been denied in the past, please apply again because things have changed. It's a lot easier to qualify. Like I said, there's no cap, there's no income requirement, so it doesn't matter how much income you make. Um, and we really wanna get people as much help as possible. And I wanna tell you all, it's December 3rd, your December rent is late if you haven't paid it please call us, um, go to fairhousing.net, pull that application and send it in to us and we'll help you through the process. So thank you for the question. Thank you, Ms. Mace. All right, did that answer your question? That's good news. <laughs> Share it. <laughs> no, that is wonderful. Um, so thank you. Yeah, I, I hope our audience members take, take advantage of that. Um, but unfortunately, this is all the time we have for questions. I would like to, once again, thank you, Ms. Rose Mays, for taking the time out of uh, your very busy schedule to join us today for this very important talk. Um, and thank you to all of our attendees. Our next online event will be next Thursday, December 10th, when Dr. Zach Parolin of Columbia University talks about California poverty during COVID-19. You can learn more about that and other UCR School of Public Policy events at spp.ucr.edu. Um, again, this was just such a wonderful event and I learned so, so much um, that can really help uh, residents of, of Riverside County. So thank you so much, Ms. Mays, um, and we hope to see you and our audience members again. Okay, thank you so very much. And again, please call us, we will help you. Yes. Students continue to march on. Thank you so much. <laughs>